TSN's Motoring 94 is brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, one tough motor oil. And Midas, for brake, exhaust, suspension, and steering service, trust your car to Midas. Some of Canada's best race drivers began in a go-kart. Paul Tracy, Scott Goodyear, the late Gilles Villeneuve, and the list goes on. But I'll guarantee you, none of them drove indoors. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Motoring 94. Now, we are at the only indoor go-kart track in the world. And we'll tell you more about that later on. But first, we're going to begin by heading into the country for an afternoon of classic driving. The Christie Pitts Conservation Area near Hamilton, Ontario was the meeting place for vintage cars and their proud owners. More than 60 classics battle it out in sprint races for a charity to beautify the park. This was the first of what is hoped will be an annual event. What's been happening over the years with vintage racing is the, the newer cars have been pushing the older cars out. So a lot of the pre-war competitors didn't have to, a, a place to play. Well, a chap by the name of Lee Abrahamson got hold of the conservation people and started looking at a couple of sites. The Christie people called him up and said, come have a look at Christie. We came down, took one look, and said, yes, <laughs> this is it. Well, the Super is a Super Sport with the 1933 car. Um, it has the Jap water-cooled V-twin 1100cc engine, 900 pounds a car, and it's all kinds of performance for its day. It's two-seater, three-wheeler. It's just perfect for this kind of uh, event. Sprints, hill climbs, not for racing too. This has been the best weekend I've had for a long time. And we came up from New Jersey, um, from near Princeton. It's a whole day's drive to get up here, but it's well worth every minute. And fire it up, Armstrong starter. Among those in attendance was actor Don Franks and his 1924 Model T Ford. Well, they're going just fine. Uh, there's a lot of gravel on the road. You gotta be very, very, very careful of it. And when you've got a fenderless car, it throws you know, gravel up and uh, it, uh, there's a lot of flex in a Model T, so that uh, sometimes, uh, you know, you're sort of going like this and uh, a lot of broad sliding and having that, being able to break that one wheel on the corner is really helping out. So it's, uh, it's a very fast race, but they won't, uh, they won't time me today, give me any time because I'm not wearing a helmet. Five, four, three, two, one. This is the grandfather of all the racing cars here. Everything that's out here is a grandfather right here. This is the shade tree mechanic, the guy that couldn't afford Bugattis. He couldn't afford Stutz Bearcats. He couldn't afford Mercer Raceabouts, but he could take a Model T Ford for $20 and then work, a little, work hard and get himself an overhead valve set up figure out what kind of front end he wanted to put on it, what kind of body that he wanted to put on it, and go racing, and yet take his girl out to the dance on uh, Saturday night, as long as the mother and the father didn't know, because, you know, anybody that would drive a car like this was definitely a ne'er-do-well. You wouldn't want your daughter to go out in a car like this, you know. No fenders, no windshield, no muffler. It's tough being an outlaw. Test Drive with Graham Fletcher. This week on Test Drive, we look at the 1995 Windstar. Now, this is the vehicle Ford Hope will knock Chrysler's very popular magic wagon off the top of the heap. 
Now the reason the minivan market is so important in Canada is that in 1993 there were over 157,000 units sold. That makes it a very lucrative segment of the marketplace. In designing the Windstar, it's obvious that Ford had their thinking caps on. On for the most part, that is. My very first impression of the vehicle was its sheer size. It is almost two feet longer than the regular caravan and some eight inches longer than the Grand Caravan. Now factor in the couple of extra inches in width and you end up with a vehicle that has a decidedly ponderous feel. In the long run, this shouldn't hurt them, but in the short term, I think it will. The reason? The initial test drive will turn a lot of people off. My wife, for example, drove it round the block and took an instant dislike to the feel. Andy Jacobson, the executive director of truck design, suggests that Ford wanted the Windstar to give the illusion of being smaller than its competition. They missed the boat on that one. The ergonomics and comfort and convenience items have been well thought out. There's a very nice large storage bin, wonderful spot for your cassettes and CDs, dual coffee cup holders with a spot for your donut or your cigarette, very nice user-friendly heater controls and a radio that sits in the right spot on the dash and that's above the heater controls. On the subject of the heater, this neat little vent in the raised portion of the door panel does a wonderful job of keeping the side windows clear. The other nice part, if you happen to take the key out without winding a window up, not a problem. The retained power feature looks after that very nicely. Elsewhere in the interior, the choice of fabrics and materials used throughout offer a soft, warm, inviting feeling. To ensure the requisite level of ventilation to the rear passengers, Ford have routed the ducting up the B-pillar and out to some handy overhead vents. The results are sure to be appreciated by all occupants. On the left side of the van, there are auxiliary controls for the climate control as well as the radio. The nice part being that the driver can lock out the radio controls. This will stop the kids from driving the driver around the bend. Power is supplied by a very nice 3.8 litre V6. It rates at 155 horsepower and a very healthy 220 pounds feet of torque. The result is good throttle response throughout the operating range. Even with the van loaded with junk, it still offers better than average pickup. A lot of credit going to the seamless four-speed automatic transmission. For those into trivia, this is the same powertrain found in the Lincoln Continental. An on-off button for the overdrive helps eliminate unwanted gear shifts around town. The downside is the fuel economy and serviceability. At an average of 16.4 litres per 100 kilometres or 17 miles per gallon, it's thirsty. But forget about any home maintenance program. You can't even see the plugs, let alone reach them. Versatility is an integral part of any minivan. Well, this Windstar has got a surprising flaw. Take the back seat out and you've now limited the seating capacity to four. So if you, your wife and your three kids want to go on vacation, you better get the coin out now and flip to see who stays home. Despite my criticism, the overall versatility of the Windstar is fairly good. Perhaps the most convenient feature is the ability to fold down both the seat backs and accommodate a 4x8 sheet of drywall without having to take the seats out. If you do remove both seats, you end up with a whopping 144 cubic feet of cargo capacity. In terms of occupant safety, the Windstar is a definite hit. You'll find dual airbags, side impact members in the doors, and perhaps best of all, anti-lock brakes are standard. During the brake test, I hauled this large vehicle to a halt in just 123 feet from 80K. This and the excellent pedal feel are to be commended. The suspension is comprised of McPherson struts and a stabilizer bar up front with coil springs and gas pressurized shocks in back. The ride quality offered by this setup is quite simply second to none. Now this should come as no surprise as the benchmark for the ride characteristics was Ford's own Taurus wagon. When it comes to the handling department, the Windstar fares pretty well. The front stabilizer bar adds to the overall feel appreciably. That said, the on-center feel imparted by the steering wheel could be better. I go back to that ponderous feel I started with at the very beginning. Well, that's it for this week's test drive. Will the Windstar knock the Chrysler off as the minivan market champ? The answer is no. The lack of a five-passenger configuration in this particular vehicle and its rather large, ponderous feel are going to hinder sales. It's time to take a look at the service items on our long-term Jetta. Open the hood and the layout is very thoughtfully put together. 
All levels that need to be checked on a regular basis are clearly marked. This holds true for the oil, brake, coolant and washer fluid levels. Access to the spark plugs and oil filter are such that any do-it-yourselfer could easily tackle a tune-up. The other item worthy of note is the thermal blanket around the battery. With the winter we've just endured, this thing could spell the difference between go and no-go. All major bulbs can be replaced without the need for tools. In the rear, for instance, simply pull back a cover and pop the bulb cluster. The fuse panel is located in a less than easy to reach location. That said, replacing the fuses themselves can be accomplished with ease. Next week, we'll take a look at the cost of some commonly replaced parts. They're go-karting indoors, and there's only one place, they tell me, in the world that you can participate, and we're at that place this week on Motoring 94. The place is Fun City in North York, just outside of Toronto. And with me, the inspiration and the owner behind Fun City, Stan Budd. And Stan, we want to talk about the go-karting, but there's much more to Fun City, you tell me, than just go-karting. That's correct. Uh, we have 150,000 square feet of family fun. It's year-round, indoor, so that people can do everything that's outside in the summer, inside in the winter as well. See, another thing is we're smoke-free, drug-free, alcohol-free, so and we have total security, so people are actually bringing some kids here, leaving them, going away shopping, and then coming back and picking them up because they don't have to worry about them once they're in our environment. It's the only uh, go-kart of its kind in the world where they're battery-operated. They have, obviously, gas go-karts, but you can't put those inside in Ontario because of the law. And so we developed these go-karts ourselves, and we're the first ones with these batteries and this system to allow them to run indoors. And we have 33 go-karts on a 2,000-foot track, and uh, we run them 15 at a time or 16 at a time on the track so that when 16 are running, the other 16 are being loaded. Incidentally, the batteries take eight hours to charge and they'll last anywhere from two and a half to three hours. And the guys tell me that once they get them into pit row, they can change a battery in just under three minutes. All right, it's now time to head to the Motoring 94 garage to join Bill Gardner. Fairly common problem that afflicts cars is pinging. I'm sure at one time or another, you've probably all heard a car that you've either been driving or been a passenger in pinging and that's that kind of rattling noise, clattering noise that you tend to get when the engine's under load. It's most obvious when you're accelerating or cruising at highway speeds and you try to climb a slight grade or you increase the throttle slightly at highway speeds. You may hear a clattering sound in the engine, almost sounds like you dropped a bag of marbles on the floor or even into that engine. It's a horrible sound. If you're working with machinery, it makes you cringe to hear that sound and it, it can be a harmful thing if it's left unchecked. Now I've prepared a checklist of some of the things that you want to uh, look into if you notice that your car is pinging under, those, uh, under load. And one of the first things you want to check, of course, is check the ignition timing and spark advance. Now many engines today have non-adjustable timing and the spark uh, advance curve is controlled electronically so you really can't adjust it or fiddle with it. In most cases those cars don't have problems in those areas. But if you have an older car with a distributor, you want to check the basic ignition timing and the spark advance. Now the remedy might be as close as your gas pump, of course, and if you, if you try a higher octane fuel, that may remedy the situation as well. Move up in steps, try mid-grade and then uh, high octane or even one of the ultra high octane gasolines and see if moving up the octane ladder remedies the situation. Don't go all the way to the top at once because then you won't know the severity of the problem. Another thing you want to verify is the operation of the EGR system. Now EGR stands for Exhaust Gas Recirculation Valve and most people think of it strictly as an emission control device. It is, but it also has a huge effect on engine pinging. If the EGR valve is not opening or not flowing as it should, the engine will be extremely prone to pinging. Also check the heated air intake system. Uh, it's designed to bring the engine quickly to operating temperature but once the engine reaches operating temperature, it has to open and allow cooler, fresh air to come from ahead of the radiator or the engine will be more prone to pinging. Another thing you can check is uh, try and purge the engine of carbon. We've got a number of uh, cleaners assembled here today that you can see that uh, are all beneficial for decarbonizing an engine. Some should be used by professionals or follow the instructions very closely if you're not familiar with them. Others you just add to the fuel and drive the car on the highway. Also check the spark plug heat range 
make sure that the correct uh, heat range of spark plug is in the engine. That can have an effect on pinging as well. Those are all things that you can uh, check over if you've got a pinging problem. Remember that uh, if the problem is minor, you may be able to live with it and some minor pinging under certain conditions uh, you can live with. But if the pinging problem is severe or uh, extensive, it's something that can severely damage the engine. You shouldn't let it go unchecked. Uh, listen for it on grades or anytime you're advancing the throttle at highway speed. And if you hear it, try and take some steps to alleviate it. Here's a vehicle that, once again, is number one in its segment. The coupe, however, is the number one selling coupe, the Cavalier coupe, that is, in the industry. No one sells more two-door cars than Chevrolet's Cavalier by nameplate. So with that thought in mind, it's our distinct pleasure to introduce the 1995 Cavaliers. The New York Auto Show was the venue for the world introduction of the totally new 1995 Chevrolet Cavalier. Uh, the new Cavalier has been totally redesigned for 1995. The car is a substantial change from the prior car. It is larger on the inside, substantially, has a larger trunk, a more interior space, has vastly improved body structure, which allows us to have a much improved ride in the car. In addition, we've added dual airbags, and we continue with the standard ABS which in its class will be an extremely high value to have those two features standard. Well, as the, the single biggest seller, it is important to us. We think that we'll not only hold the share that we've gained with Cavalier, but move forward on both the coupe and the sedan side, with most of the growth probably coming on sedan. Coupe will continue to grow as well, but sedan is the most important. Uh, the Neon is, would be a clear competitor against the 95 Cavalier. You have to look very carefully at the Neon when you compare it. Uh, for example, the base Neon does not have power steering, and as soon as you want power steering, you have to add $1,861 in a package to get it. Uh, in addition, the base Neon does not have uh, the shipping charge, the $500 shipping charge. They also charge extra for many of their paint colors, $97. A lot of the stuff that is optional on the Neon is already standard in the Cavalier. Some of that stuff, like the dual airbags and the standard ABS, are very important to the customer in this market. This customer does not have a lot of money but they are very concerned about their safety and security in the car, so having those two features standard at a price that I believe, when you see it against a comparably equipped Neon, will be very comparable, is very important. Along with the excitement of the introduction of the 95 Cavalier, there was evidence that paranoia is beginning to eat away at Chevrolet, or at least on the part of Chevrolet's general manager, Jim Perkins, as he addressed the international media. But here's another fact. Through February, we lead Ford in full-size pickup sales by 5,000 trucks. I expect it's gonna be a shootout to the end of the year and good gosh knows what'll happen at the end, but we're gonna be in the race just like we've been in the race every year. It's just that right now we have a jump going into this, this, this time and uh, this, this point in time. If you will, allow me an observation. <clears throat> Frankly, if this was another manufacturer talking the press would be all over this story. It would be terrific. But when Chevrolet makes these gains, some of you greet it with indifference at best. And that's not being critical, it's just being honest. Now, I understand healthy skepticism. Believe me, I do. I deal with it a lot. But folks, I believe the time for skepticism is long past. Simple as he stated, Chevrolet is back, and genuine Chevrolet is our new way of life. Before we turn it over to questions, I'd like to put um, possibly a couple of other things on the table in the way of some other points. First, some press reports I've seen have stated that uh, Cavalier and Saturn are due for a showdown. Well, I wish you guys would quit saying that, quite honestly, because it doesn't help. It's not the truth. And quite honestly, you know, we don't look at Saturn as a competitor for us. They don't look at us the same way. So let's get that straight now and just have a rule that we just won't do that anymore. Saturn is not our enemy. Let me make that statement and make it clear. We're not aimed at Saturn at all. Saturn was created as an import fighter. Cavalier has a much broader mission, and that simply is to increase our penetration in the small car market against competitive domestic nameplates and any other import, import intenders. Now, I'm not going to announce prices of these two new cars today. That comes a little later. I could tell you, <clears throat> but then I'd have to kill you if I did, and uh, you've got other things to do today. Why does General Motors always insist on shooting the messenger? I'll tell you why in Kenzie's Corner. A 
The Midas tip of the week concerns washing away the worst effects of winter. Salt and grit build up in your vehicle in areas where you can't always see them. After you finish washing the exterior and cleaning the interior of your car, think about those underbody areas and open the hood and have a look for accumulations of salt. They're easy to spot and they're also easy to wash away. One thing you don't want to do is use the high pressure wash machines that are quite common in use today. Uh, for example, at the coin wash, you see clouds of steam billowing off cars when they're being washed in the wintertime. That's fine for the exterior, but you don't want all that steam near some of these critical components. For example, on this pickup truck, the anti-lock brake module for the rear brakes is right over this inner fender, and all that steam can eventually damage components of that nature. So just use cold water and a garden hose, low pressure, do a little bit of scrubbing, and you can rinse all that salt away. Now while today's cars and trucks are made of far more corrosion resistant materials than they've ever been, you can still quite easily see the effects that salt has on metallic components. For example, this inner fender from an 86 car we just changed recently, you can see the salt has eaten completely through that fender. The sooner you can get that salt washed out of there and cleaned out of there, the better it is for your vehicle. That's the Midas tip of the week. Kenzie's Corner with Jim Kenzie. Earlier in the show, you heard the general manager of the Chevrolet division, Jim Perkins, complaining about media coverage of the new Chevrolet products. He thinks we should be talking more about what Chevrolet is doing. Well, Jimmy, let me explain to you why we're just a little bit cynical. And it's not just because my blood type is B negative. You see, a few years ago, the guy that was sitting in your chair was apologizing for the lack of Chevrolet's competitiveness. He said, we're trying real hard, but we're not there yet. So those of us who've been covering the industry for a while, we kind of sat back and said, tell you what, give us a call when you're there. Now Perkins' remarks were at the introduction of the 1995 Cavalier, and that was additional reason for us to be just a trifle cynical. The last time Chevrolet introduced a Cavalier was in 1982, 12 years ago, and they said that this was the car that was going to drive the Honda Accord back into the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, right. It's taken them 12 years to update it. Now the new Cavalier looks really nice. It's got a lot of good features. But I tell you what, I'm going to wait until I actually drive the car before I comment on it. And then, Mr. Perkins, I can assure you, you get all the coverage you deserve. I'm Jim Kenzie. Now, come on, fellow drivers, let's be honest. Are there not days when you feel like doing just this to your fellow motorists? Just kidding, officer. Well, that is it for this week's edition of Motoring 94, coming to you from Fun city in North York, just outside of Toronto. And yes, we have had fun, and next week we'll have more fun as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. TSN's Motoring 94 has been brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, one tough motor oil. And Midas, for brake, exhaust, suspension, and steering service, trust your car to Midas.